Okay, Dennis. So the uh, we've already done the uh, the patient interview portion of our diagnostic process. We've also done the um, um, the in extra oral intra oral examination. Now it's time to take a look at the radiograph and see what's going on. I put the radiograph as the sixth step because it's important to kind of put that in perspective about what is its significance in terms of the diagnostic picture. Okay, so Ali, here's a question. What if you have a radiograph that's presented to you by the patient, and um, it's pretty clear that, you know, t when you look at it, that there's, a, you know, a lesion or something like that. Yeah. What's wrong with making the diagnosis just from the x-ray alone? Well, making a diagnosis based on the x-ray is basically what a lot of people do, uh, unfortunately, because it's not the right way but they get away with it because most of the time you might be right because the radiograph is a fairly telling piece of the evidence. However, it's not the whole. And going back to our analogy with the horses and the zebras, uh, you know, while you will be able to be right most of the time just making a diagnosis based on the radiograph, you would be wrong some of the times. And I certainly don't want to be the patient who you know, who's, my clinician is wrong some of the times uh, based on not gathering all the information that's available. So, realistically, do you take that x-ray and not look at it and put it at, at, at the conclusion of your exam, or do you... Well, I'm going to be honest with okay, you. Yeah, I, I do, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ideally, we want it to be the sixth step, and you're not biased by looking at the radiograph, okay. but we're all human, including myself. And okay. Yeah, so I walk into the room, the x-ray is already there, and I am, uh, I do take a look at it. However, I try to consciously be aware that I shouldn't be making a diagnosis based on what I just saw. Maybe the x-ray will just kind of give me a little idea about what is Hint. possibly a problem that I should be looking into along with all the other potentials so I don't get sidetracked by what I see and end up with a biased status beginning my uh, whole clinical examination on my interview. So it's very important to keep uh, track of that. In fact, one of the big pet peeves at the school is if any of the residents come up to me and show me a radiograph and say, what do you think about this? My answer, my stock answer usually is, well, it's a good radiograph. Because the key for people to understand is that radiograph is only one piece of the puzzle, and it's never the whole puzzle. So it's important to put its importance in perspective, and as we're going to talk about in a moment about some of the limitations of the radiographs. But more importantly, what kind of information do we need from a radiograph when we get started? Okay. Generally, what I like to, uh, to, to do is to have my uh, assistant take three radiographs before we come in. And that is for the oral, you know, the limited oral evaluation of a patient who comes in with a chief complaint of pain. And those three x-rays are either a straight x-ray from to the area where the patient is complaining about. If they're complaining about a tooth, let's say a tooth number 30, for example, a mandibular first molar, I like to have a straight on shot of that tooth, a slightly angled 15 degrees, you know, 20 degrees angle of that tooth, as well as a bite wing radiograph because there's a lot of information that you can get from the bite wing radiograph that you normally can't get from the, um, uh, the straight on shot and the other uh, tests. And also, I try to also look at these radiographs that are obtained and evaluate them systematically uh, as well. So, Ali, two things. When you look at an x-ray, somebody presents you an x-ray. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have to be disciplined in how you look at it. So you start looking at it from the broad outside perspective and you work down and narrow the scope yes. of what you're looking at mm -hmm. consistently each time you look at the radiograph. So you look at the bone pattern, trabeculation, all those kinds of things go mm -hmm. first. But tell me, what, what do you sense might be some limitations of x-rays? You, know, you know, I have an x-ray and I don't see a lesion or a yeah. do see a lesion. What's all that about? Yeah. There's unfortunately a certain amount of sensitivity associated with the radiographs that we obtain, especially the periapical radiographs. Um, there is only so much information that can be captured with a straight on x-ray okay. to create a two-dimensional picture of a tooth. Uh, x-rays clearly do not show any um, uh, soft tissue problem. So when we see you know, when we oftentimes point to, uh, to an area of radiolucency in a, in a radiograph to a patient, we say this is an infection. Clearly, we can't know that that's infection. All we know from a radiograph alone is bone loss. That's the only information uh, that the x-ray can tell us, areas of decalcification and loss of calcium. So um, 
we infer the infection based on the overall picture that the patient is presenting with in terms of their pulpal and periapical clinical diagnosis. Okay. So that's um, one of the limitations of the x-ray. And also in terms of the sensitivity of the capture of the radiograph alone, there was a classic study that was done in the 1960s by doctors Bender and Selter that are pioneers in endodontic uh, therapy. And what they did is they took uh, mandibles and what they did is they um, basically drilled a bunch of uh, uh, round holes into the body of the mandible using different depths and tried to see at basically at what depth can you finally see something on the radiograph. And they found that they're using the film that they were using at the time, that it took a few millimeters of bone loss at the cortical bone level before you could actually see it radiographically, that you could denude all the calcified um, cortical bone inside the mandible, and it still wouldn't show radiographically, that you needed to have critical cortical bone uh, loss before you could actually see something radiographically. And that is a limitation of radiographs, and it has to do with how much bone has to be lost before you can actually see it radiographically, which is an important thing to realize because just because you don't see something on a radiograph, it doesn't mean it's there. It's not there. Mm. So especially in the mandible where you have thick cortical bone, you could lose a lot of, you know, you can have a lot of infection in the marrow space of the jaw and that wouldn't show radiographically until the infection gets to a critical level that starts to erode the right amount of uh, bone from the cortical bone that you can suddenly see an impression on the uh, x-ray. We actually replicated Bender and Seltzer's study uh, while I was in graduate school, and we took uh, number 10 round burrs. We extracted a tooth mm -hmm. right from the mandible, and then we took 10 round burrs and went right through the apical space into the cancellous bone, and we just kept making it larger and larger, larger and larger, larger and larger. And you know, you could not see that. Yeah. Even though it was a sizable area, you could not see it yep. until we started working against the On cortical, the cortical plate. bone. The cortical yeah. plate is basically the whole thing. Yeah. And that's why one of the radiographic things that we look at is the lamina dura, because that's, the lamina dura is the cortical bone that is the lining of the alveolar plate, right? right? That, that, that uh, the alveolar bone that is supporting the tooth structure. So when that gets eroded at the apex of the tooth, that's a telltale sign right. that there's bone loss. And because after that is lost, then the rest of it is, is cancellous bone and you can't see it. So that, that's, uh, that's part of the thing that we're it looking at. It speaks to the limitations of the x-ray. It, it's no it's always about. important to keep yeah. in mind the limitations of what you're looking at. Also, the other thing, there's a big limitation of radiographs, conventional radiographs, is the fact that they're two-dimensional. I mean, you're basically taking your jaw and you're compressing it in two dimensions by giving in a shadow of it, basically, which is what radiography is, is casting shadows. So depending on the angle that the radiograph is shot at, you will have information that is useful or it could be misleading in terms of forming artifacts. So it's very important to make sure that your radiographs are quality. So three radiographs that are of good quality are critical to making a proper diagnosis. Now. One of the other things that I want to talk uh, about is that, you know, there is a difference between doing a full mouth examination on a patient that comes in without a chief complaint versus a patient that comes in either on an emergency basis or with a complaint uh, that requires a limited oral examination. Mm -hmm. Now, full mouth radiographs are obviously uh, wonderful in terms of the amount of information you can get from them uh, when a patient is coming for a full, uh, full mouth examination. But, you know, as endodontists, we don't even have the luxury of having access to that information. Uh, general dentists who are seeing the patient most of the time for the first diagnosis of the uh, of a chief complaint have access to the historical radiographs that they have as a full mouth radiograph. And should use them. And yeah. should use them to their benefit because there's a lot of information that you can gain from historical information that you could compare to the x-rays from that day to see a change in time. Because another thing, it's a limitation in radiographs is the fact that they're static moments in time. Mm -hmm. They're captured moments in time at the time that the patient is presenting to you. So you may see something that may look like pathology to you, or you don't know if it's a marrow space, or you don't know if it's just some artifact. If you have older x-rays you can compare to, that would be really helpful mm -hmm. because it can give you a sense of perspective in terms of time. For endodontists or other people who don't have access to the full mouth radiographs, always sometimes having a panorex would be very helpful too, especially in situations in which you, um, you know, you, you think you have a younger patient, you think you might have um, some kind of a uh, pathology in the bone, whether it's an impacted tooth or any kind of a, you know, additional pathology that you want to check into, um, the uh, panorex would be a quick way of being able to capture that information and have information that is bilateral. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be very helpful. 
Another new thing in, uh, mm -hmm. in endodontics and in dentistry as a whole is the uh, use of CBCTs. Cone beam technology has improved dramatically, and especially for endodontic use now, you can have limited uh, cone beam, uh, limited field uh, cone beam technology that really reduces the amount of radiation that the patient gets. So you could use um, these digital sensors with a uh, limited field, expose a very small amount of radi radiation to the patient, and finally be able to see things in three dimensions that you weren't able to see previously. Um, you know, as we mentioned, a radi regular radiograph, periapical radiograph is a two-dimensional picture, but a CBCT allows you to use software to reconstruct a three-dimensional picture of a tooth. And I tell you, Dennis, when it comes to endodontic therapy, there's nothing like taking a sat, uh, taking an axial section from a tooth mm -hmm. and being able to look from the top to the down by looking at all these sections. It gives you a tremendous amount of information that is extremely helpful in many different types of pathologies. So this particular case that uh, you were just speaking about um, that was uh, on the, available on the screen, that was an internal resorption, an external resorption case. What was that? So that's been actually part of the um, um, a diagnostic challenge in the past. When you take a regular uh, radiograph from a tooth and you, have, you see an area of resorption, mm -hmm. you don't know, beca uh, because it's a two-dimensional picture, whether that area is superficial, deep, is it on the buccal side, on the lingual side, exactly. is it internal in the tooth, is it external on the outside of the tooth or not? Mm -hmm. And previously there were, you know, before CBCTs, we had to do with the technology we had available, which was basically taking multiple x-rays at different angles. Yeah. And using the old slob rule, which is the, you know, if it moves towards the same side of the cone, then it's on the lingual. Yeah. Uh, and then if it's moving away from uh, the side that you've put the cone angle to, yeah. then it would be the buckle. So taking several x-rays, you could almost do what a CBCT does with a computer, which is generate a three-dimensional image. And uh, that's what we did. But uh, now with the CBCTs, you can find out if a problem is internal or external. And oftentimes, we're seeing an increase in the amount of external root resorption in teeth. And this, this, off, uh, this can be seen, uh, um, this could be diagnosed a lot easier using CBCT technology. So in this particular case that uh, we mentioned, was, uh, it was an external resorption that started externally. However, oftentimes in these cases, the external resorption enters inside the tooth and then starts to mushroom inside the tooth. And what initiated externally will end up being uh, appear like a big ex internal resorption case as well. So... Would you advocate that if someone, a uh, general practitioner or endodontist, either one, mm -hmm. were to find an external resorption case, yeah. what they believe is an external resorption case, would you be an advocate that that demands the use of a, uh, the CBCT, uh, or is that something? Absolutely. I think a CBCT is a critical part of uh, helping you with the other tests, which we're going to get into uh, in a moment. Okay. Uh, but um, it's not a standard of care at the present time. So not every patient who comes in with a chief complaint should be getting a CBCT. Um, but there are specific uses for the CP like where it's critical and it's very helpful and it can do for you what you can't, it gives you information that you can't otherwise get from your uh, two-dimensional radiographs. Okay. But let's take a quick look at a regular x-ray and see when you see a patient uh, which, preve uh, which presents to you with a specific chief complaint, how would you just go about taking a look at the x-ray? And as I said, as we said, I like to use the external in approach in everything from extraoral to intraoral and also the radiography section. Mm -hmm. We always basically first pay attention to the things that you don't care about. Then you focus on the things that you care about because by doing that, you make sure that you don't miss the things that you don't mm -hmm. care about. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is probably the best way to make it systematic. So you always start by making a general analysis, looking from the outside in portion of the radiograph, look at the bone, the supporting structures, in this case, on the mandibular area, you can see that there is a little bit of a diffuse radiolucency in the inferior portion of the radiograph, and that basically is indicative uh, of possibly pathology or uh, very likely, as you can see anatomically in this area, due to the presence of a depression that is caused by the attachment of the mylohyoid bone, you may end up having a mandibular fossa area that is fairly mm -hmm. deep in a patient, and it creates a change in density radiographically in the uh, buccal uh, lingual direction and the top portion of the radiograph compared to the bottom portion of the radiograph. So it's important to kind of consider uh, this information, and again, 
which I hope is really the critical thing that we're trying to hammer home, you never make a, radio, uh, a diagnosis based on a single piece of evidence. You would take a look at this uh, radiograph, see this diffuse radiolucency, and then you would end up doing cold testing on all of those teeth, vitality testing, percussion palpation, and then based on your findings, you would arrive at some uh, additional um, you know, differential diagnosis. And here, after looking at the bone and the surrounding structures, looking at the cortical bone, the trabeculation and the pattern of bone, you then start to look at the lamina dura. You try to look at its continuity. You can see here in this tooth that you're having a little bit what, of what appears to be a thickening of the periodontal ligament uh, in, around the mesial roots of this tooth. But it's also significant to know that this could be a radiographic artifact and that having multiple x-ray and different angles will be helpful. You may want to make a note of that, but you can't know for sure if that is just the angle at which the radiograph was taken or if it is just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or if it is indeed, uh, you know, apical periodontitis. Uh, because that determination has been made when you combine this information with the information from your percussion and your palpation and your pulp vitality tests to arrive at that diagnosis. Yeah, it could, so, look, it could look very different on just a slight change of the Absolutely. Complexion. I mean, I've seen cases where it just normally looks like you have a, a periodontal ligament thickening, but it's uh, across the board in most of the cases, yeah. most, of the, uh, most of the teeth and the apices. Also, what they then start to look inside the tooth, look at the uh, shape of the apex, look at the anatomy of the roots, and then look at the pulp uh, inside the roots, see what is going on, how much calcification, was there the right. strophic calcification going on or not. Uh, we all know that the, the pulp responds to injury, chronic injury, by placement of reparative dentin or reactive dentin so that it can ward itself off of the insulting uh, source. Uh, and sometimes seeing calcification can help you know that, well, there has been a source of uh, irritation to the pulp that has been there historically. But again, that in itself doesn't mean anything, mm -hmm. uh, but it's important to make a note of that. And then finally, we take a look at the crown and the restorations that are on top, whether there is fillings uh, or any other kind of restorations, try to estimate its proximity to the pulp and find out what is the quality of the restorations. And that is a really critical thing to keep in mind. And that's where the bite wing comes handy because it gives you a lot more information that you don't otherwise have. The reason you have three uh, different angles is you can get additional information. So on a straight shot, for example, on a case uh, like this where you have a maxillary molar, uh, the straight shot looks like you have a little bit of a lesion around the mesobuccal root, but everything else looks fairly straightforward. But when you take a bite wing, you realize that there is a considerable amount of space underneath that restoration, that there's radiolucency under the restoration that hasn't been filled. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I can't tell you, sometimes I've gone in there and I've found a cotton pellet from the original root canal in these cases. Sometimes during the placement of the post, there was just a big void that was produced due to improper cementation. Cement wasn't adequately placed. Mm -hmm. Anytime where there is space inside the tooth that could act as a potential source of potential coronal leakage. And then when you take the angle shot in this tooth as well, you will see that there is, uh, the lesion is wrapping around the mesiobuccal root. There's only one uh, root canal that has been treated. And one of my experiences has been that anytime you see a lesion around the mesiobuccal root of a maxillary molar, where there's only one root that's been treated, uh, you can almost <laughs> bet that there is an MB2 that, is, that was missed and is the source of the infection. So in a case like this, you, this imp imp information is important because uh, not only are you trying to make a pulpal and a periapical uh, diagnosis, but you're also trying to treat them plan a case like this. And these types of information that you get from a radiograph can also help you with your treatment planning decisions uh, later on down the line, whether you would treat this uh, surgically or whether you would go on and treat this uh, non-surgically through retreatment. Right. Uh, so coronal leakage is an important thing. Bite wings also help us, Dennis, in cases where you have uh, teeth where um, a crown is placed and then you're... Um, you know, your assistant might take the x-ray with increasingly causing either a for lengthening or for shortening of the tooth by misangulating the x-ray head so that the, the margins of the crown end up covering too much of the coronal structure, which is why the best way to check the fit of your crowns is by taking bite wings. And in a case like this, when diagnostically we take a bite wing, we realize that a tooth that looked like it didn't have any restorations now shows that on the mesial aspect of it, uh, you have had a... Um, a restoration that has been placed below the margin of the tooth, which kind of tells you a little bit about the history of the tooth as well, that this patient probably had a crown place, no root canal, then ended up having uh, caries that was probably diagnosed during a regular, uh, you know, 
uh, oral hygiene visit, and then the, the dentist went on and did a restoration to kind of patch that area of decay. And invariably, things like this don't work in the long run, that the pulp becomes necrotic and there's a problem. So this kind of information that you capture radiographically can help you fine tune your, uh, um, your testing and focus maybe on specific teeth versus the other ones. Again, bite wings uh, for a tooth like this, for example, that show a premolar where the crown looks perfectly fine, but the patient still has uh, thermal sensitivity uh, on this uh, tooth and uh, occasional chewing sensitivity. Um, if you only base this on the bite wing, you may kind of think that maybe the radiolucency around the distal buccal root of the molar is the main problem. But when you take a bite wing radiograph, you realize that there is an open margin on the uh, premolar. And you know, combined with the patient's uh, chief complaint of thermal sensitivity, it explains that that tooth is most likely the cause of the coal sensitivity in that area compared to uh, the radiolucency that you see on the straight on shot. Once again, angled x-rays on the maxillary uh, molars, first molars, where there is a lesion only around the mesiobuccal root. Invariably, it's an MB2 that is missing. When you take an angled x-ray, you can see a little bit of space. If the cone, if the filling or the file shot that you take, the, you know, it, it's on the side, it just goes to show that there is uh, an additional canal there. So these things are diagnostic in the sense of treatment planning as well as just uh, understanding what, uh, that there is a lesion there. Also, sometimes you can miss a, uh, a frank radiolucency based on the angle of the x-ray. On a straight-on shot, you may not see the, radio, uh, the radiolucency, but a slightly different angle can suddenly show you mm -hmm. a uh, radiolucency that's very clear and present in an area. And obviously, during a situation where in your oral examination you found a sinus tract, you should always trace the sinus tract. We talked about this a little bit earlier on. And, it and is an indication. An Just don't trace it. Just trace it, take and a radiograph. Take it, radiograph. Right. And a size 30 or 4 got a cone seems to be um, a good, good size for uh, that, um, you know, for, for being able to kind of um, uh, see the tracing and see where it goes. All right, so we've seen a lot of cases, a lot of x-rays. Mm -hmm. X-rays obviously are really important to the overall diagnostic mm -hmm. material that you have. What do you do, and all of us have had this situation, what do you do when you still cannot make a differential diagnosis? You yeah. Know, you're, you're at a point in time, you've done all the tests, patient says, I'm having pain, you don't have an answer. Well, up until now, we've had the six uh, steps that we've completed, and the majority of the time, we're going to have an answer, thankfully. Thankfully, yes. But there are those um, cases where we don't have an answer, and for that, we have the other tests that we do. And in order to go over that, let's take a little break and come back to go over some of the other tests that are also applicable in some cases in which we cannot diagnose the, uh, the source of the pain uh, readily. Perfect.